The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. My baby dolls, we're back again. Always excited to do another episode of Genesis. And as always, I am your host, Ian Kahanowitz. And we have another recurring guest today. I love when people come back to me. It makes me feel wanted in the baseball world. we got Tim Wendell. Now we're going to be talking about the baseball seasons from 1992 up until the strike. Of course, Tim has been on my show twice, once for the summer of 68, and of course one for the 1991 uh, season with the Twins. Both of those books can be purchased on Amazon. And, I, and you know, some of the holidays are coming up, folks. And I'll tell you one thing, summer 68 and 1991, those books that Tim you know, wrote, very, very important. Both of them create what was known as a watershed in baseball history because in 1992, right after the Twins won that miraculous season, we have the coming of Bud Selig. And, of course, 1968 revolutionized what was to come after that season, lowering the mound, uh, expanding the strike zone, divisional play, uh, league being split up. And, of course, both of these seasons created the seasons that came afterwards, which were never comparable to those kind of seasons. And uh, today we're going to be talking about Faye Vincent resigning. We're talking about how Toronto finally, after all these years, gets to the head of it. Not only that, but for God's sakes, I had Dave Winfield, Jack Marsh. They're able to get all these great guys who, as a Yankee fan, you just cringe because the Yankees came in, I think, fifth or sixth place that year. So, you know, it's just one of those things. The divisionals uh, would, would even realignment would occur. Bud Selig would come in, and baseball would change forever. But, but even before we get to Tim, and even before we get to uh, the whole 92-94 uh, to 94 season, hey, the baseball winter meetings are coming up. All right? All these things with free agents, and it's all, all that, and all the speculations. You know, we had a great season this year, Houston. Uh, kudos to them. My Yankees at least took them to seven, but then so did uh, Los Angeles. But you know some It was a great season. I don't like the changes. I don't like this wild card uh, playoff game. But you know some Baseball's back. And, you know, and uh, I, although it's been not our national pastime in a long time, I hate to say it, but I did some research. And baseball's ranked fourth. American uh, sports these days of likability. Um, you know, I hear from the experts that little leagues are down probably 50% in the last 10 years. And what's looking like a dying sport in 2017 was invigorated by both this Major League Baseball season and, of course, Jim Leland earlier in the year winning hey, the World Baseball Cup in 2017. The Americans pulled it off. So, you know, some baseball is getting exciting again. I just hope um, that the game evolves into something that's going to be more interesting to kids. Because I'll tell you the truth, my kids are into track and football, hockey and basketball, and baseball truly to them is the fourth sport. Um, so <laughs> even my own kids growing up, and they're going to be 10 in a few days, uh, you can't convince them. The only thing they say to me is, when you die, can we take over your show and, like, turn it into an all-sports show rather than <laughs> too much a baseball show? So that's the love your kids give you. When can I be on your show, Daddy? Well, when I drop that, you can do whatever you want. So that's that. Um, hey, Tim Wendell. And, of course, you know, I always like to plug for Tim. And he has a new book coming out in spring of 2018, not on sports, but on cancer crossings, a brother, his doctor's, and the quest for your cure to childhood leukemia. Look for that in spring 2018. Tim is the author of 13 books, and they're both fiction and nonfiction, folks, and a writer in residence in John Hopkins University. All the big shots, they live in D.C., you know. I mean, I used to live in New York, and that didn't do me any good, but all the big shots, they live down there. You know, we have uh, a few other authors that I um, I know. Tom uh, Dunkel lives down there. He wrote Colorblind and... Of course, if you've ever been down in D.C., you know, I always like taking the metro down there. I think it's awesome. It's a big change from both New York and Boston. But, you know, and I never stay in D.C. I always stay in, like, Rockville, Maryland, and just take the metro in. So um, that's what I think of D.C. I like walking around it, but I won't be caught dead at night there. His books include The Summer of 68, 
High Heat, Red Rain, and Castro's Curveball. His writings have appeared in the New York Times, National Geographic, Gargoyle, Washingtonian, GQ, and Esquire. Yeah, you know, I've been an Esquire for like the last 20 years. You don't see me writing for that magazine. And, uh, you know, just passing your bar doesn't count anymore. Pulitzer Prize winner David Moranis has called Wendell's work a winning mix of science, biography, and mythology. The New York Times, an editor's choice selection, describes his writing as sensitive and scrupulous. I always love his books. We're going to get him on when the Winter Olympics come for his uh, book on the United States hockey uh, team of 1980. And, uh, you know, I was, what, nine years old at February, and I still remember. And when you read the book, it takes me back to a place which is no longer here, unfortunately. Cable TV ruined that, but sitting in my black and white TV with the antennas, early morning, early Sunday morning, back in 1980, That'll never be revisited. Hey, without any further ado, welcome to the show, Tim. Great to be back with you, Ian. Hey, you like my kicks and giggles with my with my kids, huh? That's what they said. Hey, Dad, what are you guys? Huh? You got to keep a hand on those kids. I don't think they know what they're talking about. Yeah, well, baseball, you know. I mean, I mean, you wrote about hockey. You wrote about so much. I, I cannot say enough, especially about summer '68. It should be. Um, the source book to go when anyone researches uh, that topic, as well as the 91 season. Let's talk about something that uh, has come to light for me within the last few months uh, after finishing uh, pretty much my book on Ty Cobb and Tris Speaker and the Dutch Line Affair, the collusion in baseball, Faye Vincent, he succeeds Giamatti, everyone's caught up with Rose, but behind the stands, hey, the owners are paying out $280 million. And Vincent uh, falls out of favor with the owners. And, um, you know, he just, he just kills. He kills Bud Selig, who who's owns the Milwaukee Brewers, and Jerry Ryan's off for the, um, uh, the White Sox. He says the union basically doesn't trust the ownership because there was collusion and was a $280 million theft by Selig and Reisendorf of that money from the players. I mean, they rigged the signing of free agents. They got caught. They paid $280 million to the players. And I think that's polluted labor relations in baseball ever since it happened. Very much What's going so. on? And it's, and it's kind of funny. When you look at it, baseball was in a good place. Um, just had an amazing World Series in 91, you know, arguably one of the best of all times between the Twins and the Braves, two teams that go worse to first. You had this now wave of new ballparks um, on the horizon. Camden Yards is about ready to open. That turns everybody's heads, and then away we go. You know, a similar one would be built in Cleveland, on and on, Cincinnati, you know, uh, Colorado and Denver, et cetera, and yet greed gets in the way here. And, and in a lot of ways, as you're pointing out, say Vincent's kind of, he's the canary in the coal mine. He's kind of going, guys, uh, we can do better than this, talking to the owners. And the owners don't want to hear it. The owners, in a sense, want to push ahead with this $280 million collusion case, and it bites them. And it bites them bad. And I think it's funny, in, in prepping for the show, you know, I was, I was working at Baseball Weekly at this point. This was into our now second and third year of publication. And with a rosy time, everybody was into baseball. If your kids had been alive, they'd been into baseball, too. And I think, um, but again, it's greed that gets in the way. And Vincent, bless his heart, tries to tell the owners, why so? you got to do better than this. This is, in a sense, from a legal standpoint, even an ethical standpoint, it's going to cost you. And it did. And unfortunately, you've got a number of uh, athletes, Jack Morris probably being one of the main ones that Tim Raines comes to mind, et cetera, who get caught in the middle of all this, should have been paid a lot more for the services that they rendered. But it's Vincent, Vincent's resignation, pretty much after the owners vote against him, that in looking back on this, this is the big crack in the wall. And this has been building, as you well know, we've got, in a sense, three different uh, in a sense, layers of collusion involving different athletes. But it's Vincent, in a sense, saying, we've got to get our act together because you're absolutely right in what you just said. The players' union doesn't trust us. 
And if anything, this acrimony, this distrust builds over the next couple of seasons that results in the debacle of 1994 where the World Series is canceled, et cetera. And it's so funny because it's, it's percolating below the surface, and yet people in the game that know are very alarmed uh, by this. In fact, I was just looking at something else for a piece I was writing about Jose Canseco and the PEDs taking off in Oakland and, in a sense, Mark McGuire going from, you know, like a skinny guy to somebody who just, you know, looks like something out of the cartoon. And I stumbled across some testimony that Rob Manfred gave on Capitol Hill roughly about this time. And Rob Manfred, of course, now the commissioner of baseball, and he's being asked, by, in a sense, the, the Senate committee he's in front of at that on that day, how did PEDs, what, what happened? Were you guys asleep at the switch, away it went, et cetera? And some people will say, oh, it was all somewhat a conspiracy, obviously, after the strike of 94 or after the labor debacle of 94. I'll just let it go. We need something big, you know, hence the home run derby and everything with between Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa. But Manfred said something very interesting in his testimony. He said something, in fact, that people were so worried and there was so much disagreement about the money. We're talking about within ownership, but also the way they're dealing with the players' union. There's so much disagreement. In essence, we took our eye off the ball when it came to PED. And this is the, this is the gorilla in the room. And if you look at just kind of the baseball season of 92, 93, it's Redemption somewhat for Pat Gillick and the Toronto Blue Jays. It's um, a real, I think, changing of the guard uh, between kind of the Oakland A's and now the Toronto Blue Jays take over and win back-to-back championships. All that's great, and it's you know something I'm hoping we're going to talk some more about too. But underneath it is Vincent's resignation that's in- indicating something's really rotten you know, at the core here. And unfortunately, that's what's going to bubble out in a couple more seasons. And the problem is, in my opinion, of course, Bud Selig just got his plaque in the Hall of Fame. (laughs) And of course, Bud was in baseball since 1970s, I think. He was with uh, Milwaukee all those years. And now he's coming to the forefront as commissioner. And if you look at the statistics... If you look at the facts, he did, he was well deep in collusion to prevent what happened 10 years earlier with the arbitrator's ruling, the site's ruling saying, hey, guys are free agents. The 81 strike tried to limit it, and now, hey, we can't win in the courts. We can't do this. Let's what? Let's make an agreement and hold salaries down. And that's exactly what they did. And Bud Selig was at the forefront. 1986 for me, this is where we get to Jack Morris. Mm-hmm. Morris mm-hmm. is coming to New York. I'm all, I'm all giddy like that. I'm like, boy, all these years of obscurity, Morris is coming. And then Steinbrenner walks away and doesn't even offer him. He has to go back to Detroit. No offers are on the table. No free agents are uh, changing hands. Did collusion actually hurt Morris's chances to getting into the Hall of Fame? I think it did, and I think it did on a, maybe a couple of different levels, Ian. I think it did, number one, if he signs with the Yankees, obviously that's a much bigger showcase. And at that point, people got to remember that Jack Morris was regarded by many as the pitcher of that era. Uh, Nolan Ryan has told me that. A number of writers have written up the same thing. Um, Morris gets a little bit caught at times because if it's a seven to six ball game, he's going to pitch, he's going to obviously try to win it, but he's going to pitch maybe a little bit differently um, than he would maybe in a three to two or one to nothing ball game. He, he was very proud of the fact and he felt it, it helped his, um, how long he played in the league, but he felt he was very proud that he played to the situation. Oh, I got a three run lead. I'm going to pitch differently than I will if I'm locked in a, you know, zero-zero scoreless tie as he was with his protege, John Smoltz, in the Game 7 of the 91 World Series. And I think in some ways what people forget is something else was going on that hadn't really 
come to fruition yet, and we see it a lot now, and this could be one reason why your kids, you know, don't cotton to baseball as much as we all hope they would, is the role of bullpen. In a sense, we saw it again in the recent World Series. Rich Hill coming out and, you know, five innings in, four and a third innings in, et cetera, because everybody's so unarmored with their bullpens. Bullpens are still kind of accelerating, and that's Tony La Russa and Dave Duncan turning Dennis Eckersley into the consummate closer in Oakland. But that hasn't happened throughout baseball yet. So the reason I bring that up is somebody like Jack Morris is from the old school. He's from the Ryan school. He's from the Koufax school. He's from the Drysdale school. These are the guys he kind of grew up with or were his peers certainly with Ryan. You went, you went to the mound in the first inning with the goal of finishing the game. You were going to do nine innings. You weren't going to go five or six or even less sometimes in the case of poor Rich Hill recently and then kind of be looking to the bullpen. Bullpens weren't set up that way yet. Baseball was not set up that way yet. And so if you talk to Morris, as I have, you know, after his playing days, that's something he's proud of. It's like going, oh, they gave me a four-run lead. I'm going to pitch differently, hence the ERA goes up. Collusion hurts because he doesn't play for the Yankees. He goes back to Detroit. And suddenly, because of it, he gets a chip on his shoulder, which I think is, you know, really understandable. He didn't get paid what he was due uh, when when he, in a sense, had earned it by his performance on the field. So it suddenly becomes much more of a hired gun. You know, in a sense, he plays the one year, goes back home to the Twin Cities, helps the Twins win a World Series. Everything's lovey-dovey. What's he do? He jumps to Toronto. I think part of that is him thinking, well, are the Twins really going to be back in the World Series? Maybe not. Look at what the Blue Jays have put together. Maybe I can be the guy to put them over the top. But I think he also goes to Toronto and then goes on to Cleveland because, in a sense, he's trying to make up the money he felt he lost through collusion. And uh, you look at some of the guys who are really uh, – just last year, I was talking to Phil Micro, who's part of collusion kind of the first way with Tommy John and Kirk Gibson. And then you got Morris coming along with Tim Raines and such and Ron Guidry um, after the 86 season. All these guys, and then later on, even Paul Molitor, Jack Clark, Dennis Martinez, with the next wave, you get talking money with all these guys, and they feel they got burned. And mo- some of them are more, you know, uh, animated about it than others. But I think certainly in the case of Jack Morris, he felt, hang on, you're preaching teamwork and loyalty and all that. But when push comes to shove and I'm due a big contract, it doesn't happen. If anything, I'm embarrassed by going to New York and suddenly Steinbrenner, in a sense, pulls the offer as he do, had done with Rich Gedman. Um, I'm sorry, well, with Carlton Fisk, uh, you know, previously. So it's uh, – you can see why they have an attitude about it. And I don't think it maybe totally justifies it, but – if I feel I'm due some money and it looks like everything is working out and at the last minute the contract disappears and then I hear later it's because um, the, the group of bosses got together and pulled it from me, I guess I'd be pretty upset too. Yeah, you know, that's that's huge. And I think when you look back to the 80s, you know, Jack Morris was the best pitcher. It's not a pitcher that we could have today because it's bullpen by committee. Yankees bullpen, Houston, you know, you see all these three, four, five relievers that get going, and it's just a different game. And I think the Veterans Committee should take a harder look at Jack Morris and see what could have been because of collusion and also Mm -hmm. the stats without collusion. And I I guarantee it he would pass the WRAs and all these different configurations, the wars and all this stuff, and he would be voted in. Now, let me ask you this. How is Toronto rising now? Not the Yankees. The Yankees have the biggest payroll with $47 mm-hmm. million. That was pretty low-key today. $47 million. <laughs> and yet, <laughs> Toronto, you know, and that, yet Toronto has built a powerhouse. Winfield they get. Jack Morris they get. What's going on in Toronto? Why do people want to play up in Canada? I think it's because of something that's, I think Ian kind of forgotten today a little bit, and that's patience, and that's willing to take 
the heat when you feel you've put together what should work. And what I'm talking about here is Pat Gillis, who I've gotten to know over the years. In fact, I was on the Veterans commit, Committee with him two years ago. Uh, and just very thoughtful, knowledgeable baseball guy. I first talked with him in doing the book High Heat, where I went in search of the fastest pitcher of all time. And one of the guys in there is Steve Delkowski, who I knew nothing about. And Pat was um, Delkowski's roommate in Elmira in the minor league organization for the Orioles. And just the way he talked about Delkowski, you know, he loved the guy. And he's, he's still – Amazed that Delkowski didn't become this consummate closer for the Orioles, let's say, in the mid '60s. If you got to remember, '91, especially, after, you know, at coming off '91, the Twins had won it all, and the Twins had beaten the Blue Jays, and the Blue Jays were becoming the perpetual, you know, bridesmaid type of thing, never winner, and and they had great teams. I mean, their outfield even previously with, uh, you know, some of the guys they had was just awesome. And in the press, even not, not even in Toronto, but also throughout baseball, was Pat has got to blow this team up and he's got to start over because obviously this group of individuals just isn't going to work. And he didn't. In fact, the part of it was you got to fire your manager. That's Cito Gaston. He can't win the big game. So if anything, I find some of the criticism that Cito Gaston faced back then to being similar to what maybe Dusty Baker faces now. Um, you know, everybody's saying great regular season manager gets to the playoffs, can't do it. Gillett, to his credit, told pretty much the team and certainly told Gaston, I'll take the heat. I think you guys can do it. And since I'm not going to make major, major, I'm not going to blow this team up. And he was really criticized, especially after they didn't get to the World Series in 91 and even got the nickname Stan Pat, Stan Pat Gillett. And I think what you see now coming out in 92 and in 93, and gosh knows what would have happened in 94, because I think Toronto was loaded again, so they have won three times in a row, um, is, in a sense, he's reaping the benefits. He reaps the benefits of that, and, and the Blue Jays become this very consistent winner in baseball and win back-to-back championships. And I was always struck by how, and Gillick was a reflection of this. Gillick certainly set the tone. But how mature the Blue Jays' front office was back then. You had Paul Beeston, who would certainly go on and become involved, uh, almost you know, saves baseball from the labor debacle in 94 and then becomes involved with commissioner's office, et cetera. But I can remember back um, during the World Series in 93, and getting from Atlanta to, um, in a sense, Toronto was tough, in a sense, and in, in terms of, uh, you know, flight flight arrangements. And everybody goes, oh, who cares? You know, you're covering the World Series. Yeah, I, I agree with that. But it was it was difficult. Only one airline, I remember, I think it was just U.S. Airways, was flying between the two cities direct. Everything else was, you know, changing in Chicago or JFK, et cetera. Um, and... After a game in, um, in in 93, I'm sorry, it was Philadelphia, Philadelphia and Toronto. After in Philadelphia, I went to get on the flight, and um, my seat was gone. I was like, oh, no, my. You know, how, how am I going to get to Toronto? This, what was supposed to be like a you know an hour and a half flight is now going to turn into a whole day thing. And I don't get that worked up, but I had been up all night, and, you know, they had taken my feet away, and who knows, maybe they give it to that killer. <laughs> no, they didn't give it to that killer, but who knows, who knows. But, um, and I'm getting kind of worked up there at the, at the check-in counter at the airport. And they're pretty much saying, I'm sorry, they're, we're sorry, Mr. Wendell, you're not going to get a seat. And I'm starting to, you know, get worked up. And suddenly somebody taps me on the shoulder, and I turned and I went, huh? And it was Peter Witterington. Peter Witterington, for people that don't know, at that point was the president of the Blue Jays, very much a self-made guy, had made his way up through the ranks of Labatt, which at that point the, the beer company owned the Blue Jays, had started as a salesman somewhere off in Podunk somewhere in northern Ontario, and had worked his way on up, and 
in a sense, with now the president of the Blue Jays. And he, and, he, and he just looked at me, and I didn't know him super well, but we did know each other. And he said, you got bumped from this flight. I went, yeah, yeah, Peter, I got bumped from this flight, and I'm pretty upset. And he said, guess what? I got bumped from this flight, too. I went, oh, okay, now I'm seeing even the big dogs can have some trouble every now and then. He said, I'll tell you what. Uh, why don't you tell this woman, instead of yelling at her, why don't you tell her to get, book you on that next flight, and I know there's room, to book you on the next flight into Buffalo. And they're, okay, that sounds good, but Buffalo is still an hour and a half from Toronto. What am I going to do, get a bus? And he goes, no, get yourself on that flight, and then you can ride in my limo, which I just requested, and we'll go to Toronto. And I went, oh, okay, this is how you get things done. You don't get all agitated. You try to figure out what the next thing is. And Gillick was very much a, a product of that. And I think in keeping the Blue Jays together, he then was allowed, and he had certainly started to get the money because the attendance for the Blue Jays was amazing during that point. Oh, uh, let's start adding some guys. Let's add a Jack Morris. Let's add a Dave Winfield. Let's add a Ricky Henderson. Let's add a David Cohn. Let's add a Paul Molitor. Wow. And then instead of tearing things down, it was more, let's step back. I believe, in a sense, the core of this team. And if you look at that bullpen with um, Hanky, especially at the end of it, and here we go, things already setting up. They took the Oakland A's with Eckersley at the end, and things were a little erratic getting to Eckersley sometimes. They had Ward. They had all these other guys doing Ward. It was better. And all of a sudden it made kind of maybe a shaky rotation, Guzman and Stottlemyre, et cetera, made it so much better. And this was Gillick's – this is why Gillick's in the Hall of Fame. And he was a genius, and he's very warm to people. And I think his genius is he's able to step back and go, I still believe in the core of this team, but they need some help. Okay, let's set up the bullpen better. Wow, that one-two punch award and Hanky becomes – Unbelievable. It, it, you know, it turns into what we see today and with some teams. You better score on them by the seventh inning or you're not going to win this game. And if you believe in the core of the team, then you're able to add some prominent free agents that make some sense. Yeah, let's add Morris who just won a World Series with Minnesota. Let's add him to this, um, at times, kind of young rotation with Guzman and Stottle, Todd Stottlemyre, et cetera. Uh, let's take a guy like Winfield and rotate him in. The next year, oh, Winfield's gone. Who can we get? Paul Molitor. Wow. A guy who's hungrier than hungry to win a world championship. And, and I think that's the genius of, of Gillick. And in a sense, he was willing, he was willing to take the bad press. And I think if you look at some guys or especially some front office or GMs today, I think that's very difficult for them to do. Maybe things have accelerated with, you know, our 24-7 news churn and blogging and all this other stuff. But I think Gillick would have done the same thing today. You know, I, I still remember talking with him several years later and just said, I knew my team was good. They didn't know it yet. So maybe I had to bring in some other guys to help them believe. Yeah, you know, it's the whole, you know, that whole plugging the holes you know, you got a good team. You can even make it better. Well, look what's going on here. You know, maybe the third baseman's hitting 250, 260. You, need, you know, you got a free agent. Today, of course, the prices are exorbitant. But say you go for a lesser of a free agent. Guy might hit 280, 290, and his fielding might be better. So you're plugging a hole there. I think that kind of baseball is more important than just throwing money at a player and trying to get chemistry to gel when it really won't. I think uh, a lot of the big teams, the Mets, um, the Sox, they've tried it, and it's it, it's the old Yankee case. You just pay a bunch of big players, and they'll perform. No, it won't. There has to be gelling in uh, amongst the teammates by the coaches and, of course, the manager. And they had some great coaches. Gene Tanach from the uh, mm-hmm. uh, Oakland A's of the 1970s. They had uh, Rich Hacker, Larry Heisel. They had John Sullivan. And, of course, Hugh Gasson. 
Now, what's going on in the National League? You know, Pittsburgh, they won three divisions. This was their last year. They trade Sid Bream off in the uh, off season because, you know, the Pittsburgh uh, management can't get their acts together. I just had Richard Peterson on my show. He wrote the book, The Slide, and, of course, it's about Bream sliding in um, and uh, basically killing <laughs> the Pittsburgh Pirates in the 92 uh, championship series. What's going on in the National League here? Yeah, this is it's so unfortunate because, you know, this was – as you say, kind of a swan song for the Pirates, and they deserve so much better. But again, it's, it's, it's forces behind the scenes that people are sensing, but they don't quite realize, in a sense, the whole ramifications of it. I love those Pirates teams, and they deserve better, and unfortunately they got in a sense, ambushed by a Braves team that suddenly came of age almost overnight. Um, certainly, if you know, people look back at 91 and going into the playoffs, you would figure, yeah, it's going to be Pittsburgh versus Toronto, and then you've got two surprises with both the Twins and the Braves. I can still remember going to the All-Star game in 92, and it was in Pittsburgh. And it was, um, you know, it was a great setting and everything, and, you know, it, those things are always, you know, they're, they're always kind of enjoyable, at least on one level. Um, everybody's relaxed. Um, the players, you know, they'll the, the really talk. But I still remember working, um, going to the stadium for the game and going into, and there was just all these huge crowds outside. And, and at first I just addressed, I thought, well, they're just, there's a whole bunch of people here because they want autographs or something like that, or they're just trying to see see the stars, and and that's that's what I attributed to it at first. But I remember going in the in the clubhouse entrance again later in the day and looking around and going, something's different here. You know, we've got big crowds, yeah, but there's also I see certainly some people looking for autographs, but it's not like everybody is it's lining both sides of this corridor going into the clubhouse entrance in Pittsburgh is looking for autographs. A lot of people are just standing there looking, you know, just taking it in. And and I remember talking with a couple of them, and a couple of folks, you know, just standing there. And I said, what, what are you doing here? And and there was, there was kind of two reactions. One was, I don't know in a sense, when the Pirates are going to be that good again. So I felt I had to come down and see this. You know, it, it may be a long time before we're in the playoffs again, or maybe a long time before we're a contender again. So this type of setting, you hear this from fans, Pirates fans, maybe I better take this in because it may not happen again for a while. And the other thing, though, they sent, they knew money Ian was raising its ugly head. And already, we're talking 92, some of them said, I don't see where the owners and the players agree on much. And you're going, uh-oh, that could be an interesting situation. And and there was even talk at that point about contraction, getting rid of some teams, whatever that may be. And Pittsburgh wasn't, say, the final cut on that by any stretch of the imagination. Ironically, Minnesota and Montreal were. But there was a feeling that, in a sense, was Pittsburgh still a big league city? And maybe not. And if so, we better take a look at things right now. And so it's one of the most strangest crowds I've ever seen because it, it wasn't that happy. And it wasn't kind of the fervor that you usually get with people, hey, you know, you know so-and-so, give me your autograph, whatever it may be. It was more people just coming down almost an observation of an era that may be passing and certainly see what's on the horizon here. They had, they had some good, you know, good reason to be worried because baseball was changing quickly. And it was, I always found it intriguing that those couple nights, you know, the night of the home run derby, then the night of the game, somehow the average fan understood that the big changes were afoot. They, they couldn't – and he articulated, and then nobody really understood what it was all going to be about. 
But again, there was a sense within baseball there was too much greed and there was too much of uh, certainly on the ownership side, people looking out for themselves. You know, it's funny with, with, with Pittsburgh because with Pittsburgh, they were going to literally lose the team in the mid eighties. And they had mm-hmm. sunk right after that. We are family and, you know, the Pittsburgh drug trials of the early eighties and 1983 that they were ready to sell out the team. And the new mayor over there actually saved the pirates. And you're talking about, a baseball genesis, which had a huge following. Pittsburgh was one of the first teams, not only in Major League Baseball, I think they were called the Pittsburgh Alligators, but in the International Leagues, the Negro Leagues, you had Pittsburgh as a baseball town. You know, we have the mid-'80s crisis, and now we're coming up against contraction in the early-'90s, and, you know, collusion just ended, and now Bonds wants a good contract, and Bonilla wants a good contract, and Doug Drabeck wants a good contract, and these guys aren't willing to shell out the money for them. No, and they didn't. I think one reason, Ian, they weren't willing is I kind of wonder if they had it. You know, I don't think they had it to sign all these guys, but it was it, 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 it's a very unfortunate situation because that team, that team was a lot of fun to watch, but then you start taking away some of the names and more that you just uh, – just mentioned there that Drabeck was a great pitcher, etc. Um, a couple of years ago, I was talking with Andy Van Slyke, who was obviously on that team, and he kind of felt a little bit the way some of the fans did. He, he felt that even though, again, nobody could quite nail everything down, but he said when he looks back on those days, we're talking Pirates early 90s, he felt it was an end of an era, and not just for a team, but in some ways for the game. And um, again, he, he always he was one of the guys noticing, wow, so and so across the diamonds really ripped. He was one of the first to really to kind of put two and two together on the PED situation and steroids. And then you see what happened to one of his former teammates in Bond, etc. It's um. It's funny, when you talk to players from that team and even in talking with the fans a couple of nights over that All-Star weekend, the, what I remember was almost this um, atmosphere of, of regret. This time's running out. And as you say, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh's a great baseball town, but it's a savvy baseball town. It's not going to be a town that necessarily follows the team that, is not that well put together or is not playing the game um, maybe the correct way. They're, they're very um, discerning fans there, and they can certainly see through things. And they've got a jewel of a ballpark now, PNC, and, you know, one that I still drive up to periodically from Washington because I just love watching games there and walk across the Clemente Bridge, etc. But underneath it, um, and that certainly bring people in, but – you need a good team to be there. Because you look at some of the teams that won. You know, you, you went back to the, kind of the dawn of baseball, but, you know, those great pirate teams of Clemente and the We Are Family, I mean, those were epic teams that played the game in a very – they played it the right way. And, and I think in some ways that part of the country, that's what they expect. That's what they expect from a ball team. And, uh, and it's – it's unfortunate at times when, um, you know, the ownership can't deliver. But I look back at ownership of the Pirates at that point in time, and ouch, they were they were in a world of hurt, I think, with the bottom line. Things had gotten better, and one of the major things you start to see in the early 90s, and we've discussed this a little bit in the past, is kind of the rise of, a, of your regional fan base. Oh, if you're a Pirate in the Pirates front office or a Pirates fan, you're not just in Pittsburgh. You're probably all of Western, all of Western Pennsylvania, man, up to Erie, going all the way over, probably trying to, you know, get as close into Cleveland as you can, into, into Ohio, et cetera. You know, talk about the Twins, it's not just Minnesota. It goes up into Dakotas, all this. And that all seems, you know, perfectly reasonable and, yeah, to be expected today. But back then, it wasn't. 
And I think marketing and salesmanship has really picked up as much as kind of the regional TV bases, which has helped out some of these teams. But back in the early 90s, it was like, gee, we can't get 15,000 in a night to watch a pirate game. We're in trouble. And nobody had quite thought of yet, well, maybe you start cobbling together a really good regional TV base and maybe you get people coming up all the way from West Virginia, wherever it may be. In a sense, you've got to extend things much, much farther out. You know, it's funny because we are on the East Coast and, you know, everyone is just so regional, you know, the Nationals and the Orioles and the Red Sox. And, you know, it's funny because I come from Brooklyn. My family still lives in Brooklyn, New York. And I'm up here in this Red Sox nation. The dividing line is Hartford. Everything east of Hartford is Red Sox nation. Everything west of Hartford is pretty much Yankee or Mets uh, nation. And when you talk about Pittsburgh, when you talk about Buffalo, uh, the football team, because they, I think the Buffalo Bisons are still a uh, baseball team, the fans are rabid in that, in that kind of lake region over there. And mm. it surprised me with Pittsburgh. Even Leland knew it was the end. I think he went to go on to coach um, the Marlins or Colorado, one of the two. I forget who he went to. Yeah, the Marlins, yeah. Yeah, and he won the world championship with him. And, um, you know, I mean, he went. He, I remember him waving to all the fans. And, and and the thing is, they built this great team from 85 to 92. They, uh, You know, you had run-ins with Bonds. He was this kid coming out of... You know, God, here's Bobby Bond's son, Big Shot. Andy Van Slyke was one of the few people who called him out on it. You know, he said, hey, you know, you want all these big bucks. My average is just as good as yours, and I'm hitting just as many home runs as yours, as you are. And there was really problems in that locker room, and the management didn't stop it. They, they all knew collusion's ending. They were all looking at dollar signs. And, uh, you know, it, it came to a point where, uh, Leland just exploded on Bonds in the in uh, one of the, one of these spring training games. He had, he was yelling at a coach. I think I forgot who the coach was. Yeah, I go back 25 years. What do you expect? But um, Leland even knew he saw the writing on the wall. They're not giving a penny uh, for investing in this team. And it was really sad. I really enjoyed watching Pittsburgh. Yeah, they were a fun team. And I think you're absolutely right. They're again one of the in a sense, um, alarm bells that are going off. You know, if Pittsburgh can't keep at least some degree of that, you know, young core of players that they have together, something's wrong. And you, you have these, you know, everything high, high 2020, but you, you know, you look back at things and Pittsburgh, Vincent resigning, you know, it starts to add up. And um, it's, it, it's really kind of unfortunate because some of you end up in a situation where, you know, Bud Sealy becomes commissioner. In my mind, it's certainly those first couple of years. I never felt, even though Sealy was commissioner in name, he had the title, I always thought Jerry Reinsdorf was the commissioner. You know, Reinsdorf was the power behind the throne. And that's changed, you know, in, in say, recent decades and everything. But I think that's what Vincent ran into. I think in some ways, that's what the players on the Pirates, um, you know, ran into is just these inklings that, you know, are soon becoming borne out that business as usual isn't going to cut it anymore. And there's something wrong. There's something like going sideways. And unfortunately, it starts erupting in places like Pittsburgh first and, and in the front office of baseball, et cetera. It's, uh, and, you know, like I say, it's, it's hindsight 2020 looking back on it. But these are the things, you know, things like the labor debacle 194 don't happen out of the blue. You know, they, they have to have some serious cracks in the wall, and these, in a sense, were among them. It's, um, it's funny because I was looking at some stuff, you know, before we chatted today, and some of the things that Vincent says as he resigned, you know, things like, well, I'm the last commissioner, that's a sad thing. In yeah, way, right. he was he was the last commissioner. You know, others may be called commissioner, but in a lot of ways he was the last commissioner because he was an independent commissioner. And after that it certainly became, Oh my goodness, and we're we got ex owners and, and things like that. So it's um and, and one of the things Vincent did point out too, 
is he went back to collusion. And he pretty much said, in a sense, you made a $280 million mistake. He's telling the owners that, in a sense, saying the, the players don't trust you because of this. And, you know, that was that was allowed to ride as, you know, just kind of allowed to play out. And guys like Morris and Reigns and such had to make do. But players remember that. And so, therefore, that makes them maybe a little bit more strident and a little bit more determined or angry when push comes to shove and suddenly we end up with a labor stoppage, you know, a couple of years later. And, you know, people don't uh, – you know, I'm going to end my inquiry here. We're never going to get to 94, and that's fine because I need this for another show. I think this was great just what it is, just throwing 1992 and all the stuff. It even turned out better than I thought. <laughs> but I do want to point out Jerry Reinsdorf, two things. One, he – was the owner of the Bulls and the White Sox. And number two, again, the new Kaminsky Park took place right in this uh, period. Uh, I think it was the second ballpark to go up right after Cameron Yards, if memory serves me uh, correct. I forget. Yeah, yeah I, I believe it was the second one. And, and it didn't – I remember being very critical of it in print, the new Kaminsky Park, when it went up because we were – I think a lot of baseball was very excited about um, what had happened in Baltimore, that it came to yard. Oh, here comes a new new one. And I remember sitting down with an architect um, who, you know, knew his way around the ballpark, wasn't involved in the building of that. And I remember going to the opening of the new Comiskey and going, okay, I this kind of looks the same as Camden. It's trying but something's off. And then I went up in the upper deck, and as I rode somewhere, and I got kind of criticized for it, but I'll stay, I'll stick by it to this day. The the upper deck was so steep, I think I wrote something like that, because you needed a Sherpa guide to make sure you got to your seat. I mean, it was like just kind of <laughs> tied in and start going up the mountain. And I couldn't imagine older people up there. My gosh, that was scary. And I finally sat down with this one architect who wasn't involved with it, but he was a Chicago-based architect, and he knew knew his way around stadiums. Um, I said, what happened here? Because this, to me, this isn't Camden. And maybe maybe it is, but maybe I'm missing the boat. He just said, you know what happened? And I went, no. And he sat down and diagrammed it all out. And he actually had some of the blueprints, and he had some photographs. And he said, you see what's different here? And I and I'm going, no, help me out. They put another layer of, uh, in a sense, sky boxes of luxury suites in there. And when you do that, the more levels you need of, of luxury suites, the, the, it'll fall apart. In a sense, the, the, the ballpark, the stadium cannot be, certainly from the upper deck, as close to the field as, say, Camden or even going back in time, Ebbets. Field or places like that, it, it just it just won't hold. If you're going to add that many layers of luxury suites, like they did at New Comiskey, you've got to you've got to build back. In a sense, the the upper deck's got to be back, and it's probably got to be steeper. I don't think it's got to be as steep as what it is in Chicago. And they did that again for money. You know, the luxury suites were all the rage then, in part because football was making so much money hand over fist with luxury suites. So ownership, since Reinsdorf in the case of Chicago, everybody's all excited, hey, how many more luxury suites can we pack into these things? Unfortunately, what people don't realize is that if you pack in a lot of luxury suites, it means for the average fan, especially the poor guys in the upper deck, man, you're in the ozone at that point. And that's what happened in Chicago. And there was a lot of pushback. There was a lot of criticism about the way that was built. And then, then you see Cleveland kind of threading the eye of the needle. Okay, we got luxury suites. They're not maybe going to go crazy with it. And maybe we're going to have some other things like that left field, um, you know, a place where people can stand that's excessive enough for home run balls, et cetera. They start putting in more bells and whistles uh, that will make it, apropos for the average fan, and the PNC certainly did that in Pittsburgh, et cetera. But I think you're absolutely right, Ian. Um, Chicago was not – it was supposed to be following in the footsteps of Camden, but it didn't. And one reason it did, uh, it went to, went off the tracks 
because of money. Again, people got greedy instead of so many luxury suites. Can we pack in some more? And and that changes the whole ambiance. It changes the whole feel of the game. And I want to end with Ryan's door because people don't realize, you know, first of all, I never want to equate myself with Jerry Reinsdorf, but <laughs> his professional life was a tax attorney. That's what I did. You know, I got my master's in tax and accounting, and I was a lawyer, so I became a tax. Except he fought, he was in the IRS. I fought the IRS. I still fight the IRS. <laughs> but, but, too, he made his money, uh, and I also did real estate. He made his money in real estate, uh, which... He was smart enough to see the uh, court case, Frank Lyon Company versus the USA, uh, which, uh, again, they allowed economic owners of realty to sell property and lease it back while transferring the tax deductions for depreciation to the title owner. And that's what Reisdorf did. He took his tax knowledge, put it into real estate, and he made the money. Now, with that being said, the real estate, he treated his work as horribly. And when you want to, when you want to talk about, you know, he broke up the Bulls after the '98 season. Again, he owned the Bulls, he owned the White Sox. But what people don't understand is he was instrumental in 1981 against labor. He has been the most anti-labor, um, you know, owner amongst all of them. So my question to you is: Do you think he, you know, you made the st- you made the statement? He ran. He pretty much ran baseball. Do you think he was a huge influence over Bud Selig? Yeah, I think he was, and I think for two reasons. Number one, Jerry Reinsdorf's a very smart guy, and um, and it's interesting because I had some back when I was at Baseball Weekly. I did a number of profiles on him. I had some very intriguing conversations with him. He he really knows his game. He goes back, he grew up a Brooklyn Dodger fan. He's got a lot of Brooklyn Dodger memorabilia. I mean, I just love hearing him talk about the old Dodgers and, you know, the games he went to and favorite players, etc. But something, maybe something shifts when you end up in the ownership side of sports or whatever. Uh, and I'm not saying owners should be fans. I, I don't think that works. It doesn't work for the organization, and frankly, I'm, I don't think it works for putting a winning team on the on the field. But I, I found the time some of the conversations I had with him, and I'd walk away going, "How can a guy who obviously loves the game so much, in a sense, you know, you know, push things in in different directions?" And we're kind of now back to collusion. Um, we're back to building up to the labor debacle in 94, uh, et cetera. And I think he had a great deal of influence over Bud Seale. Number one, because he's smart. He knows the game. That gets Bud Seale's respect. Um, he knows the history of the game, which is, again, another thing that will turn Bud Seale's head. And I think Bud Seale, for him, one of the most important things is friendship and loyalty. And there's a friendship between those two guys, which at times I found curious, because one, Sealy kind of in a, you know, came from a smaller market team. Uh, he, he came from a place in Milwaukee that lost the ball club. And you talk with Seals about that, that crushed him. And it became one of his major things. Was, you know, when, when the Braves, you know, left, I've got to get a team back to my hometown. And Reinsdorf understands it with the Dodgers leaving Brooklyn, et cetera. But somehow, as things tease out farther, there's a disconnect. And I'm not sure how or why, you know, they do, did or do some of the things that, that, that happened, you know, because um, if you put, I think, different people in different places, for example, now we're back to the Blue Jays a little bit. If Paul Beeston has a little bit more power in the lead up to the ninety four work stoppage, I don't think we have one. And and but he didn't. In a sense, other people did, like Jerry Reinsdorf to a large extent, Bud Felix, etc. And and yet all those guys were their friends, their compadres, uh their their lords of the realm, to go off John Hellier's book a little bit, which I highly recommend. Uh, about just trying to understand how these individuals in front offices and own teams maybe act 
in ways that the rest of us find curious. And that's, uh, I, it's something that still baffles me because you, you could put Bud Selig, Jerry Reinsdorf, Paul Beeston, Peter Witterington all in the same room. They'd have a great time. They wouldn't be at each other's throats, but you kind of move them out of that room and see maybe how they would have reacted or done things maybe differently with is some of the things we've been talking about here is 92, as things start to crack open in terms of money, and PEDs, et cetera. Um, how would it have changed if somebody else had had the controls? And and that I don't know, but I, it, it's something that, you know, I've thought about a lot <laughs> over the years, and I just find it a little bit mind-boggling how we get to certain places that we get to, certainly simply because certain people are in the driver's seat. And, you know, it was a great show, Tim. I thank you for being on. You know, we're going to have you on again. We're going to have you twice. I think I'm going to get you back in January because, you know, I don't understand Massachusetts. You know, it's like when you become an owner, you become, like, disenchanted with the real people. It's like lawyers, you know. Like I, like I had a case years ago in front of a judge who used to be my superior at a firm in Boston here who will remain nameless. He becomes a judge and I have a case before him, and I clearly have won this. It's so such a, it's such an easy thing. The defense forgot their, to file their answer within 20 days, and it should be dismissed right on the merits. He's like, hey, you know, uh, counselor, today's not your day. I'm going to allow it. I'm screaming bloody murder. It's like you put on the black robe and you throw out black letter law. It's the same thing. You know, it's, um, it's, it's something that's disheartening. I think John Pessa, The Game, uh, that's also a good book. Oh, that's an awesome book. That's very good. Yeah, that's a good book to show what goes on behind the scenes. I, from doing my research on my book with Ty Cobb and really digging into Ben Johnson and and Landis, and I found a lot of great material, and then doing my, you know, shows on Marvin Miller and uh, looking at Donald Furr and the Players Union and what's going on today, I I stand up, and uh, you're you're a... uh, a writer, and I'm not sure if you know about um, the players who were denied the pension in yeah. 1980. Yeah, and Doug Gladstone wrote a book, uh, A Bit of Cup of Coffee, and it really needs exposure. Um, people are calling Steve Rogers, people are calling Tony Clark. Look, these guys don't have a pension plan, okay? You know, they were they were literally bargained out in 1980 uh, because Greeby, who was the main negotiator for the uh, the owners, and Marvin Miller, um, they were they were they were haggling, which led to the 81 strike. These guys were left out of the pension. It was not retroactive. These mm-hmm. guys don't get a pension today, and a lot of them are starving. And so I've done enough studying, and I figured I'd surround this show with collusion, labor relations. It wasn't the way I was planning to go when we first did it, but I think it was a very, very important part, which people don't know, and which is why we spoke about it so much today, to show what baseball was like back then, even now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even now. Let me leave you, Ian, with one quote. I found in studying up for the show. And this is Faye Vincent, just before he's forced out. And you talk about the canary in the coal mine. This is what he tells the owners. The single biggest reality you guys have to face up to is collusion. You stole $280 million from the players, and the players are unified to a man around that issue because you got caught, and many of you are still involved. And then there's you know, there's your smoking gun right there. And unfortunately, he's speaking the truth and was shown the door, and not enough people listen. I need to I need to contact Faye Vincent. Maybe he can give me some information on that. Who knows? You know, you never know who you're going to be talking with when you're in this baseball. But you had the good fortune of speaking to a heck of a lot of people. But uh, hey, if he could find anything on collusion, I'd be I'd be greatly appreciated on it. <laughs> Override. Let me end the show. Um, then I'll talk to you for about a minute. Folks, you know, we had a great show today. Go out, get Tim's books. We got a new book coming out in the spring. It's not on baseball, it's on cancer, but you know, Tim's such a great writer, such a resourceful writer. You know, he does his research. Go out, 
by summer of 68, by the 91 Twins. He has, uh, what else you have? You have Catching Castro, and you have the one with the, the search for the biggest, uh, the, the fastest fastball, I think, right? Yeah, high heat, where I went in search of the top fastball pitcher every, anywhere. <laughs> Which gets me in with Bob Feller, Nolan Ryan, Steve Belkowski, yeah. and opens up old can of worms. So that's a lot of fun. That's what that works. Yeah. And we got that, and we also, the Winter Olympics are coming, and wrote a book on how the United States uh, was able to get their act together with a bunch of college kids to defeat the Soviet Union, and uh, that's uh, something near to me and dear to me. And with that, uh, thank you for being on the show, Tim, for the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. I'm Ian Kahanowitz, and as always, in the immortal words of Edward R. Morrow, good night, folks, good luck, we'll see you next time.